Well, last week was the school's global climate strike, and uh, apparently maybe 1.4 million people, scholars around the world, joined in. But I have to say that I spoke to my daughter. Uh, she's in a high school up in the northwest in America, and there were plenty of posters, a lot of hoopla leading up to last Friday, and in the end, not a single student went on strike, a zero out of a large high school. And the reason is that they couldn't afford to miss any lessons because they said, you know, it would affect their grades. Now, what that means is that there's going to be large scale panic when people realize where we're at. Uh, people are in school today have been sold this dream that it's really a fantasy that somehow they can go to college and I see people on the internet saying, you know, stay in school, homie, you know, that basically if you don't go to college, you've got no future. If you think, if you're in high school today and you think college is some kind of key to a, a future, you are probably 50 years out of date. There's, there's no way in hell that you're going to come out of college and have the world at your feet. Um, it's no, it's absolutely no ticket to any kind of wealth and prosperity. And it's probably a ticket to more loans, student loans, uh, wage slavery for the amount of time that we have left. Uh, and anyway, whatever you're studying in college, it's more than likely that by the, you know, by the time you get out, by the, say, 10 years time from now, any job you can think of that you think you're going to do in college will be largely automated. So, yeah, we, we're heading for times that are very unusual and people are not with it. They, they are just so far behind. They're probably 50 years behind where, where we should be at. In terms of the IPCC, they're talking about whatever they say is going to happen in 2100 is going to happen in 2050 if you're lucky. And whatever they're saying is going to happen in 2050 is happening right, right now, here in 2019, 2020. All the things that are supposed to happen in 2050 are happening now. So my advice to you is if you're in high school is you shouldn't be thinking of these secondary motives like I will suffer now, I will do stuff I don't enjoy and I'm, you know, that's a wise move for the future. You don't have a future like your grandparents and your parents had. So if you want to spend the final years that we have on this planet in college, that's fine, all power to you. I would go as far as to say the government should be removing subsidies, making school free universally, uh, just because that's a noble pursuit. But I would heartily, heartily recommend that you live your life as if you had maybe two years more to go. If I'm wrong and you know, I would say 2030 is a good time horizon to think of our extinction um, on. And if I'm wrong, every year after that is, is Christmas. It's golden. But you are being a fool of gargantuan proportions if you're going to school or doing anything now with a secondary motive that you think is going to pay back in later years. It just isn't. There's no way in hell that it can. So... Yeah, start thinking in terms of making your life rich now. Um, and otherwise, we, we headed for a disaster scenario when suddenly everybody wakes up. So gradually, people will start waking up. And as soon as they do, they'll wake up with a rush. And then there'll be panic. Uh, and, and things are going to be ugly. So yeah, stop this denialism, this uh, complete, surreal just this unreality um, it's going to cause so much pain and if you're an educator or uh, somebody who has a position of authority in education you have to, you have to stop this BS about uh, the children's future is, is somehow related to <coughs> the academic achievements or what they're doing in school today, it absolutely isn't so you, you it's unconscionable that adults now are filling, you know, these kids' heads with bullshit as if it's the 1950s.
So, yeah, that's my little rant about that. But anyway, w my main theme in this episode is really what's, what Greta Thunberg is trying to do. So she's, if you don't know who she is, she's a 16-year-old Swedish girl. And she's been on strike, I think, since the middle of last year. Every Friday, <coughs> she's struck from her school to try and get attention from the authorities, the political leaders, um, on this imminent problem of climate change. Now, this is a very, very stupid thing to do. And it's, it's also, you know, the Sunrise Movement, should be called the Sunset Movement, by the way, but an Extinction Rebellion, all of these people are following the same pattern. And the pattern is to go and plead to the psychopaths that caused our extinction, plead with them to stop being psychopaths, is what they effectively trying to do. It's, it's the height of madness. So it's time for people um, like Greta to realize that these people are psychopaths. There's nothing you can do about it. It's too late in terms of climate change. So yeah, it's time to think in terms of how you want to spend your last years and how humanity should spend its, its last years because there's no fixes. Uh, human extinction is inevitable. It's fairly soon. And yeah, I mean, to spend the rest of the time we have in these delusions is a big mistake. So you can't plead to these psychopaths. You have to remove them. So um, how do you remove them? Eh, well, let's go through a few scenarios. So uh, I, if you were like me, you studied William Golding's Lord of the Flies in school. It was a set work uh, that William Golding start Christian <laughs> and uh, in I think uh, mid 50s he wrote this apocalyptic book about all these children uh, marooned on an island kind of like in a scenario that might be unfolding in the next decade or so uh, for for many people and that's you know these the premise was these kids English kids were in a plane that got downed and uh, then they had to make a uh, they had to survive on a desert island in the South Pacific. So the story, he, he made this story about how things fall apart, how uh, really society doesn't hold together uh, after World War II. He was thinking in terms of the disaster with fascism and uh, later communism, though he wasn't thinking of communism at the time. But he made it as a response to that and also a response to another um, novel that came out before called The Coral Island, which was a very imperialistic, uh, positivist, um, kind of could have been written by Rudyard Kipling, but it was all about how Christianity and keeping a stiff upper lip and you know, leadership can save the savages from themselves. Um, and so that, uh, that book, Coral Island, was very popular not with anarchists, of course, but uh, William Golding then, uh, to his credit, he didn't go with this Christianity can transform the world thing, which was really the kind of one of the themes of Coral Island. But anyway, so on uh, Lord of the Flies, with Lord of the Flies, how would you stop all of it going to shit? So how it starts up is Ralph becomes uh, one of the, the boys becomes a leader and he becomes leader because he grabs hold of this conch and he makes this kind of orderly system and whoever holds the conch has a semi-democracy and they're allowed to speak everybody has to listen uh, so he's doing the you know Tom Hanks thing that everybody's oh thank god somebody's taking control wow that isn't that cool we're saved no you're not in fact the very opposite so what happens in the book, uh, just a novel, of course, but uh, there's a choir group and they led by Jack, who represents basically the fascists. And it all turns, it all goes south and, you know, they have a pig's head on a spit. And to William Golding's credit, uh, he realizes that this pig's head on a spit, the beast, uh, really the beast is inside us. So that's his big insight and hooray, uh, you know, I've called it the alien cortex. 
He didn't know about the alien cortex, but yes, the beast is inside us and I've called it the alien cortex. So what do you do and how do you get out of that situation if you wound up in a de on a desert island in this kind of po post-apocalyptic survival mode, which some people, to be fair, will possibly live through. Uh, it might be that you know, you get to live in a situation just like Lord of the Flies. Well, the only cure in that situation is to basically do this. And I will paint a scenario that I would have, if I wrote Lord of the Flies, I would have made two islands. I would have made the island that they wound up on, on and then another island where there was an anarchist, somebody like, okay, I'll play the role of the anarchist and this is what I would do. And I'm, I mean this quite genuinely. Take heed if you ever wind up in the situation with me, if you are about 50 people that wind up in a survival situation on a desert island, uh, this is what I'll be doing. I assume that I'm armed and uh, what I would do is I would just sit pat and I would wait until a leader emerged. So in other words, I would wait for the Ralph character to emerge and wait for the Jack character to emerge. And then I like to think in my mind that I would assuming I knew that there was no rescue, if there was any chance of rescue, yeah, that would totally change the, the picture because, you know, the hierarchy and civilization and authoritarians would come and rescue you and that rescue would involve retribution for what I would do. And what I would do was basically in my mind's eye, I imagine sitting there, sitting pat, waiting for these couple of leaders and the adversary to emerge, then assuming I was armed, I would walk up to them and put a cap in their heads, both of them. Um, kind of harsh, uh, but in a consequentialist way, it would save a lot of pain and a lot of trouble. Now, as soon as you say that, everybody's saying, well, you're a fucking psychopath, aren't you? You say, yeah. Uh, that's correct. For uh, this one moment, I would be a psychopath because uh, for the, the greater good, in other words. So I would be this consequentialist thing that only psychopaths are. And if uh, everybody said, OK, you're a freaking psychopath too, um, you ought to be shot as well, I would take that. I would take that as punishment. Uh, and the reason my thinking goes that way is because if you left the situation as it is, the normal situation where people wind up in such a community on a desert island, what would happen is something which I would rather die. I would be prepared to die before I would live out my final years on a desert island, uh, you know, Swiss, Swiss Family Robinson style. Um, if it was going to be a hierarchy, I would rather die. Um, Yep. So, so if the collective decided that I was such a psychopath for shooting these leaders that emerged, yeah, I would take it on the chin and say, yeah, at least, you know, uh, at least you guys get to live in this kind of utopia without leaders. And yeah, I'm prepared to die because even if you're not enlightened enough to know what I was doing, um, at least I don't have to live in a hierarchy, which would be deadly for me. Now, this might all seem rather strange to you. So let me explain what would happen and what does happen uh, if you don't do what I just said and be extremely brutal, uh, go to extremes. Uh, you, there are a lot of examples of what, what happens. So imagine now the normal thing, the normal default from our culture, you would get 50 people winding up on this island after something like a plane crash or something like that. Uh, there would be some damaged individual, somebody that has had child, childhood trauma, uh, somebody that, okay, let's, let's call him Tom Hanks because, you know, everybody would follow Tom Hanks. He's so loved in America. And uh, yeah, if you look at Tom Hanks's childhood history, uh, he, the reason why he's so loved, it's, a, it's an act. He, he, when he was five years old, his parents got divorced. It was deeply traumatic for him and his life unfolded in, in this persona of the de beloved leader, you know, the 
all the guy in the movies, the everybody's hero, the Stephen Colbert would vote for him for president. Everybody would like Tom Hanks as president and leader, and everybody would think they were safe in this infantile way because in the desert island situation, Tom Hanks would arise and go like, well, let's get organized here, and then everybody would say, well, at least somebody's taking charge and getting things in order, so we should be okay. No, you wouldn't. You definitely, definitely wouldn't. And the reason is the human dynamic. So what would happen almost immediately after Tom Hanks took charge and, you know, or started to organize everybody, like, oh, you go and build a hut over there, and you go and build a signal fire, and you go and search the island, and you look for water, and everybody would feel great because they allowed to be infantile. Everybody is in a vulnerable situation. So 50 people bar a few damaged individuals, psychopaths, let's just say Tom Hanks is a psychopath, though I wouldn't like to say that. For, for our example, let's assume that he is one of these psychopaths. And he, that's not a big stretch because he's faking all these emotions that he probably doesn't feel. Um, he's an actor and probably, I don't know him in real life, but I'm assuming that this type uh, is an actor in life and they're getting narcissistic supply by stepping forward as the leader um, they're getting this uh, affirmation from the group a very very dangerous dynamic and the dynamic we fall into instantaneously in our culture so the first thing that would happen after Tom Hanks does his great organizing you know uh, authoritarian thing would be the particularly the women would organize themselves uh, around his authority. So you can well imagine this hierarchy building up, you know, as soon as they start building huts, everybody would have an individual hut and Tom Hanks and his partner or would-be partner or some woman who had his eye on him or something would, would instantly start to get the best hut. And if things didn't work out so they got the best hut on the beach then they would reorganize things and say why don't we do this as this was family robinson and we'll make tree houses and then they would wind up with the best tree house or it would naturally weave its way so that tom hanks and a partner would become king and queen in effect everybody else the women would arrange themselves you know primate style i'm not trying to be uh, misogynistic this is just simple pri the way primates work. They, the females form alliances. It becomes a king in court, and this dynamic automatically means that there's rivalry for Tom Hanks's position as every, everything gets more secure. Then uh, that leads to a division. There will be fighting. There's, the chances of the group surviving are extremely low. If everybody goes with this, at least every, somebody's taking charge, now we have a chance. No, you have zero chance if, if you allow that to happen. In my scenario, if you waited until the leaders emerge, you just pop, pop, take them out, and anybody that squeals, you know, just say like, okay, right, uh, anybody else want to be a leader? No? Okay, have the rest of the day off. What you'll find is people would be absolutely traumatized because there's this me, this gun-wielding nutcase who's just shot the, you know, Tom Hanks. They'd think they're in the worst possible, they would be traumatized. But from that position of trauma, you would see this following scenario emerge. They'd probably, when they made a hut, well, they'd probably huddle on the side of the beach for the first night. It would be completely traumatizing the whole situation for them but then that would be a cold night and the next night somebody uh, probably one of the women if the psychology is correct would would say that was a crap night we better make a shelter and they would make a communal shelter and things would go from there now the key thing in this environment is two things no one would lock up the food and no one would lock up the sex you see in the tom hanks scenario they instantly locking up the food and locking up the sex. And then there's this big hierarchy. You, in this, um, really uh, have to prove yourself to have sex. You have to prove yourself to have food. And you have to ingratiate yourself with, you know, King Hanks and Queen Hanks, whoever she is. And that's the, that's the norm for, for how things will develop if you take our cultural norms. Now, if you think, oh, I'm just making this up and it's complete bullshit, well, Actually, it did happen. In, if you go back to the mutiny on the bounty, uh, the, 
Mutiny on the Bounty was not just a movie, it really did happen. Uh, captain Bly was an actual captain and a brutal authoritarian. And on a mission that they would send to, the Royal Navy was sent to get breadfruit from Tahiti, uh, the sailors got sick of authoritarianism and they kind of went native. And so Captain Bly had a mutiny on his hands. And uh, Fletcher Christian, Tom Hanks in other words, came and uh, led uh, all the mutineers plus some Polynesian wives that they went back to Tahiti to, to get. Some, some, I presume, not entirely willingly, but anyway, they got them and took them to this refuge, uh, which is Pitcairn Island, which is one of the remotest islands in the world. And the, uh, since it wasn't chartered, the Royal Navy never found them and would have strung them up if they had of. Now, what happened to the, the mutineers on the bounty was under Fletcher Christian, exactly the scenario that I've just painted with Tom Hanks. Within five years, all the men had killed each other, either through uh, racial or sexual violence, um, through fight over, over women or racial divide with the Polynesians. So, yeah, there was only one, one guy left after five years. And when the Royal Navy found him, he had turned Christian and um, they pardoned him. But Pitcairn Island never recovered. And to this day, it's been racked by um, allegations of rape and child abuse, child sex abuse, um, and just this, this culture um, of abuse and male aggression that's um, lasted to this day. Now, do I have a counterexample? Yes, I do. I have an example of exactly what I've just said. So if you could steel yourself to be as brutal and extreme as what I've, I mentioned, there's a very good example. And if I was that person that went, you know, came up to Tom Hanks and went pop, pop, straight in the, in the, in the head, and uh, anyone else that is second lieutenant and his wife or anybody that screamed or said I was a murderer. You, basically, if you, if you topped all of those, uh, then, yeah, my defense, if everybody said, well, you're a freaking murderer, uh, we're going to put you to death, I would say, well, okay, if you insist, um, yeah, put me to death. But in my defense, the reason I did it was because of what happened in Kenya. What happened in Kenya? Well, there was a uh, anthropologist, ethologist who studied baboons in 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 Kenya. Uh, his name was Robert uh, uh, Sapolsky. Robert Sapolsky. And <clears throat> amazing thing happened. It's basically, I wish more anarchists knew about this story because it's it's almost a proof of anarchy. So. The story revolves around these two baboon troops. Uh, baboons are really horrendously violent animals and, and live in a rigidly hierarchical society. Not a very pleasant place to, to live uh, from a human perspective, just, just looking at what it, is, what it seems like to live in a, in a baboon troop. Uh, but there were, were basically these two baboon troops and one of them, the one that um, Robert uh, Sapolsky was studying, was, was called the Forest Troop. He called the Forest Troop. And they were uh, a, tr a normal tr a baboon troop that lived in the forest. And then there was this garbage dump troop. The garbage dump troop was a troop that had a territory where, unfortunately for them, uh, a lodge was built, a, tr uh, a hunting lodge. And there was a garbage, a garbage pit that soon became full of chocolate cake and all the luxuries of travel lodge living. Uh, so the garbage dump troop started to live off the garbage dump and they very quickly, they didn't need to exercise, uh, they became obese and yeah, they basically turned into Americans and it was pretty much fatal for them. Now the forest troop that uh, Sapolsky was studying the more aggressive males, uh, the, basically the leaders, the Tom Hanks, the two the testosterone-filled uh, dominant ones. Uh, the, the more dominant males, instead of uh, in the morning 
when they should have been grooming and doing social things, they were less social and they headed off to the garbage dump uh, troop where they, they fought them for whatever the, the dump truck delivered um, into the garbage pit. It was a good deal for a while until they got tuber tuberculosis from some of the garbage. Now, tuberculosis is virulent, far more virulent in baboons than it is for us human primates. And the garbage dump troop was entirely wiped out. Along with the more aggressive males who did this trips to the garbage dump, <coughs> who had this rendezvous with the, the dump truck, uh, they also got wiped out by tuberculosis. So it left the forest troop with only females and about half the males left. And the troop was entirely transformed. It went from an aggressive, uh, very unpleasant place from human perspective um, to, to live in to being essentially a chilled out hippie commune. So all the aggressive behavior left the group and the uh, incidences of grooming shot through the roof. Uh, the uh, basically the the uh, incidence of aggression f fell dramatically. There was f food sharing. I mean, it was really, as you imagined, a chilled out anarchist commune. Um, now, the interesting thing came years later, and it was the fact that this persisted. So part of the interesting thing about the story is that the male uh, baboons actually leave a troop when they're about the age of puberty. So the males in a troop are really, they come from other troops. Now, the weird thing is that this behavior, this docile, chilled out behavior lasted um, and it still lasted to this day. So this was in the early 80s. Uh, it la 20 years later, long after all the baboons from that tuberculosis episode, uh, they were all long gone and dead. Um, and the culture still persisted and, as I said, persists to this day. So it gets more interesting than that because it's wasn't just the transmission of culture. The uh, anthropologists have seen other troops which have had half the male population die off and they didn't uh, change into this uh, new, more egalitarian um, culture. Uh, what it was was that the leaders, the aggressive males, had been taken out. That was the important thing. And once that had established the culture of the troop, then new baboons that entered the troop, male baboons, they came in with the normal cultural ethos of really, you know, basically attacking the females, um, dominance and um, all this kind of aggression. They very quickly learned that this was a new culture and that didn't fly. So one of the things that did it was the, that the baboons that came in from outside, the male baboons, they were treated very well. In particular, they were given sex by the female baboons uh, in about half the time that they would normally begin grooming, they would start being groomed. And life was just so good for them that they didn't adopt all the aggressive instincts and all of this stuff that divides, so quickly divides a population on a, on a desert island, for example. So I'll put a link to the story below, but the important thing to note is it wasn't the fact that they were mimicking this culture or picking up the culture. It was just basically because of the, uh, the dynamic, because they went through this demographic bottleneck of, of eliminating all the leaders, all the testosterone-filled males, essentially. It, become, it became a very egalitarian, uh, very matriarchal uh, baboon troop, and it persisted. Um, it's, it was stable and persists to this day. So... Yep, um, that's the thing. If you if you don't have the guts to 
basically you follow through with an extreme solution to these psychopaths. If you do a Greta Thunberg and you keep on trying to petition and plead with them, uh, we're headed for a very, very grim time indeed. Uh, yeah, uh, get over your infantilization of uh, and uh, your attachment to these, these leaders. Uh, it's a very, very strong instinct in people when they in peril in something like a survival situation to look for leaders, say like, ooh, where's my daddy, where's my mummy? And if you go for where's my daddy, where's my mummy, somebody will step forward as your mummy and your daddy for certain. They'll be damaged people. They won't be regular, normal, psychologically sound people. They'll be broken people that want to fulfill that role. They're actors, just like Tom Hanks. They're acting the role of being your mummy and daddy for all these screwed up psychological reasons, mainly psychopathic, narcissism. And if they're allowed to take control, they will make a hierarchy, and that hierarchy will jeopardize your longevity. It'll certainly jeopardize uh, any quality time you could have, and it'll increase the cortisol, it'll increase the, the, the stress hormones, uh, it'll be divisive, and it almost certainly will wind up in your survival being curtailed. Um, and if you, if you do survive, the population that does survive will be riddled with all these you know, psych psychological aftershocks like child abuse, um, uh, rape, and, and uh, all these, these horrible aspects of society like they found on Pitcairn. So, yeah, tough realization, but um, an important one that I feel I should communicate with you. And are people likely to rebel and use a guillotine on these psychopaths? Is no, I don't think so. But what can I do? I can only tell you what you would need to do to have a good extinction. Do I think people are likely to do it? No. I think that people are too docile, they've been too domesticated, um, they've been infantilized till now the average age uh, an American stays in the nest is until about 24 and some even till 30, which is almost a lifetime in previous eras. So, no, I think we're in for a terrible, terrible time. And one of the reasons is people, people's attachment, this um, attachment addiction um, to psycho psychopaths. Tough, real tough. I wish it was otherwise, but that's the reality.